This is Jeff Weiss with part two of the lecture from unit three, Plant Propagation, HRT 211. In this uh, part of the lecture, we're going to uh, engage in a quick uh, review of some of the uh, uh, harmful organisms that interact with uh, horticultural plants and uh, a technique, a way of thinking about uh, managing them called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. Uh, one of the um, College Lake County faculty members um, uh, recorded a, uh, a lecture about IPM, uh, and it was fairly specific about uh, um, using IPM in your home garden, uh, but that, uh, that lecture is included in this lesson, and I urge you to, uh, to, to view it. It's interesting. It's got some great information. Um, I'm going to focus in this lecture a little bit more about uh, uh, IPM in the greenhouse, um, but some of it will also relate to my work in uh, uh, natural areas. So it might be a little bit of jumping around, but many of the concepts are going to be applicable whether you're talking about controlling uh, uh, pests in a greenhouse, in your garden at home, or out in a uh, forest preserve. And if you do have questions about uh, or get confused between the three different uh, scales of uh, this discussion, just uh, let me know. So competition uh, uh, for our horticultural plants is uh, one of the issues. Um, in divasive species, particularly uh, uh, plants that have been introduced from other parts of the world, uh, cause huge amounts of uh, damage uh, in our uh, greenhouses, nurseries, our uh, farm fields, and in our natural areas collectively adding up to over $135 a billion dollars a year in control costs. And uh, these weeds and invasive species compete for the same resources and growth factors uh, that plants require. Uh, so we um, need to understand um, how a little bit about how these uh, weeds work, why they are harmful, and uh, what are some of the uh, up approaches that we uh, can take to try to keep them under control. In addition, there's a variety of plant diseases. Uh, so in the last lecture, I talked about beneficial fungi, but there's also um, a wide uh, array of um, fungi that are harmful and in fact uh, fungi cause most plant disease problems. Um, there's a range of uh, different fungi that cause uh, damping off and they especially attack the uh, the root systems of seedling plants and uh, cuttings uh, when they're young and tender. Um, those problems are collectively called damping off. And then there's a range of things that you probably see out in uh, out in your garden, uh, powdery mildew and other um, uh, fung fungus related diseases are quite quite common out there. Um, we talked about uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria uh, as being a, a beneficial but there are also uh, uh, bacterial diseases, a uh, few uh, bacterial diseases in plants. Uh, most of them are um, fairly difficult to control. Um, common bacterial blight is one of them, and uh, uh, cultural um, uh, uh, techniques and hygiene uh, in the greenhouse uh, and in your uh, garden are um, pretty important to trying to control these. Um, diseases, uh, further um, discussion uh, uh, includes viruses. And like the others, uh, viruses can either be beneficial or harmful. The photo on the right is a tulip breaking mosaic virus, uh, which is uh, uh, considered beneficial and uh, improves the, um, the the ornamental value of some of our um, some of our tulips. And then there's um, harmful viruses, a whole range of harmful viruses that uh, can infect plants or even the uh, the the, the cells of the host plants. Uh, most of these are non-fatal uh, and they're difficult to control and because they're non-fatal -fa they uh, transmit from parent to offspring uh, especially in uh, uh, plants that we're trying to propagate asexually. So um, uh, 
uh, selecting plants for um, um, resistance and um, absence of viruses and then trying to uh, minimize the spread of viruses and in infected plants are some of the important um, issues that we'll get to in a moment when we talk about integrated pest management. So um, here is a couple of lists of uh, um, things that uh, our propagules and plant transplants will be vulnerable to. Uh, and some of these diseases, as I mentioned, can be passed on to the offspring. So in nurseries and field crops, uh, there's the problem of weeds, insects, and mites. Uh, nematodes, which are uh, uh, microscopic soil organisms. Uh, slugs, which you're all familiar with if you have a, uh, a vegetable garden. A uh, variety of other soil organisms, including fungi, bacteria, viruses. And then there's various birds and mammals uh, who also can uh, um, cause significant damage to our um, crops. Um, then there's um, the greenhouses and interior um, uh, house plants uh, have fewer um, of these uh, pests and diseases, uh, but what is what we do have uh, can uh, be very serious and very quickly move through a greenhouse uh, and infect or kill, damage or kill uh, all of the uh, plants that we're trying to grow. So. Uh, not as many weed problems, uh, mostly because we use um, media, growth media, and um, containers that have been um, disinfected. And hopefully our uh, seed sources have a few uh, weed seeds located within them. But um, algae, insects and mites, uh, bacteria and viruses and fungi are all uh, problems uh, that can um, wreak havoc in a greenhouse. So this idea of integrated pest management is illustrated by this chart. Uh, and um, the idea here is that once uh, pests, whether they be weeds, diseases, or insects, uh, become established, they are very, very difficult to eradicate. So instead, uh, what is um, at the heart of integrated pest management is the idea of trying to get these um, pests under some um, control, under enough control so that our um, crop plants can survive and um, thrive and reproduce with a, an acceptable uh, level of, of damage from these, uh, from these harmful, harmful uh, organisms. And the, at the base of this uh, pyramid are uh, uh, tools such as biological controls, um, parasites, predators, and naturally occurring pathogens that will reduce the competitive advantage of these harmful um, organisms. Uh, in the middle is a wide variety of other tools, cultural controls, we'll talk about this, uh, mechanical controls, uh, genetics and host plant resistance, and uh, sterility as some of the um, other tools in, a, uh, in an integrated pest management program. And finally, at the top, uh, are uh, chemical pesticides. And um, so pesticides are initially effective against uh, many of these organisms. However, um, they lose effectiveness over time as plants and, and, and other organisms develop resistance to these chemical pesticides and they also build up in the environment and can cause uh, pollution um, and other uh, they can uh, uh, harm non-target organisms and uh, uh, also pose a risk to human health. So some of the other principles of integrated pest management including excluding the pests from uh, access to the plants that we want to protect um, there's a wide variety of exclusion techniques, but for instance, uh, deer can be excluded from uh, plants uh, by putting cages around them. Um, the, another principle is eradication, but eradicating pests once they're established in, a, uh, in an area is uh, often extremely difficult, expensive, and may involve the use of um, quite um, dangerous chemicals. Um, 
protection um, of the plants uh, from um, um, harmful plant uh, harmful organisms can be accomplished through a variety of techniques and then increasing the resistance of our plants to those pests can be accomplished uh, um, through selective breeding um, and um, a lot of the work in genetic modif modified plants uh, GMOs has been to uh, develop uh, resistance in those plants to pests and then the specific practices uh, uh, of integrated pest management include uh, uh, physical uh, or mechanical uh, techniques, cultural, and we'll talk about hygiene and uh, other um, forms of cultural um, protection of our plants, chemical or um, use of pesticides, biological, and we'll even talk a little bit about some of the legislative practices that are um, intended to um, help um, protect plants and protect uh, uh, humans from some of the uh, practices that we other that we've uh, that we've developed so physical uh, practices include uh, mechanically cutting weeds uh, pulling weeds uh, and in a greenhouse uh, certainly uh, when you see weeds on physical inspection it's pr it's pretty feasible just to pull them out if there's just a few of them and, and avoid any use of herbicide or other um, uh, chemicals in the greenhouse. Um, but out in, uh, out in farm country and out in natural areas, um, um, weed control is a big issue and um, um, a lot of uh, weeds can be controlled by mowing them at, at, a, at an appropriate time of year or even uh, reducing their, uh, their, their, their dominance by um, conducting a, a prescribed burn. So uh, uh, burning natural areas is one of the mechanical uh, or, uh, processes that's uh, used to manage uh, pests. Um, some cultural practices here. Um, hygiene and sanitation in the greenhouse is certainly uh, something that we'll be talking about in the lab. Um, but uh, grazing and crop rotation are uh, 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 methods of reducing uh, a, a few of the um, competitors. Um, and then uh, stock plant management and media pasteurization are things that I think will come up in, uh, in, in, in the lab and in future slides here. So yeah, cultural practices, uh, one of the all-purpose uh, uh, tools that we use in the greenhouse is uh, chlorine bleach uh, to sanitize tools and uh, kill uh, algae and, uh, and fungus. It's a very effective uh, uh, product. And then uh, in um, tissue culture, uh, since a sterile uh, lab, uh, sterile um, growth medium is absolutely required, to protect plants from being uh, infested with these um, diseases, um, tools like autoclaves and sterilizers are in um, general use. Um, stock plant management, so a, a lot of um, growers use uh, stock plants for cuttings. In other words, these uh, plants are grown specifically for the purpose of producing propagules for uh, buds for uh, budding or, or um, uh, scions for producing grafts or um, uh, twigs f uh, uh, or leaves for cuttings and managing these uh, plants these stock plants in order to uh, reduce the amount of uh, of pathogens and uh, uh, damage from uh, uh, competitors is a uh, important process and these stock plants are intensively managed to um, reduce these these uh, problems uh, another cultural practice includes uh, pasteurization of media. Now, uh, our greenhouse soils will be uh, pasteurized, or, or, or actually, our, our, our greenhouse soils will be uh, non uh, will be soilless mixes, uh, and uh, they will be designed to both um, uh, not include any of these uh, disease producing organisms uh, but will also be pasteurized um, 
So pasteurization is an alternative to sterilization or fumigation with toxic chemicals. Um, the machine on the right is a uh, steam pasteurizer that is uh, commercially available used to uh, uh, process fairly large uh, quantities of soil. Um, historically, chemicals uh, such as methyl bromide have been used to totally sterilize uh, uh, or fumigate soil, and, and uh, methyl bromide kills everything, uh, including humans who get into uh, contact with it. Uh, so um, a kinder, gentler uh, approach to treating soil is pasteurization, which kills some, but not all, of the microbes and organisms in soil or media. So these fumigants are being phased out globally uh, because of their toxicity and the uh, fact that they tend to uh, uh, cause a greenhouse effect. Um, the U.S. still permits use of methyl bromide, but it's going to be phased out by 2015. Uh, so the state of the art is to pasteurize soils and to um, uh, live with uh, a few um, organisms that can uh, survive uh, that process. And then there's chemical uh, herbicides. Uh, one of the ones that you'll see in our greenhouse is Fisan 20. Um, it's uh, commonly used in the greenhouse to kill algae, fungi, bacteria, and virus. Um, out in the um, farm culture and in natural areas, um, um, more widespread use of chemical herbicides is um, employed to control weeds and invasive plants. And according to the EPA, more than 800 million pounds of herbicide was implied in the U.S. in 2007. So um, the consequences of this um, uh, we'll get to later in the course, but um, for plant propagation purposes, we're going to try to minimize the amount of herbicide that we use. And one way of reducing the amount of herbicide is to use biocontrols. And uh, biocontrol is uh, intentional release of predators, parasites, or herbivores to control pests. Um, lacewings are a common uh, 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 predator of aphids and other insects that can uh, get into our garden plants. Um, this white fly parasite uh, is one that can be used uh, to control white fly infections in tomatoes and greenhouses. And um, another um, biocontrol that's been very uh, successful in our natural areas is uh, a beetle called Gallerocella. And that beetle has uh, been very, very um, effective in reducing populations of purple loosestrife, a plant that's common to uh, wetlands and, and uh, uh, can choke off uh, waterways and completely um, infest uh, 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 high-quality wetlands. So this Gallerocella um, was released starting sometime, I'll say, 10 to 15 years ago, and has uh, largely brought this uh, this invasive weed, purple loosestrife, under control. On the other hand, many times the biocontrol agent has turned out to be a worse problem when, than the pest it was intended to control. Uh, some, ex some examples of this uh, biocontrols gone awry are the release of mongoose, in uh, islands in the Pacific. Uh, it, they release them in order to uh, control snakes, but unfortunately the mongoose found an easier time of eating uh, birds and their eggs and have uh, been responsible for wiping out entire species of birds in many of these places. Another example is the cane toad released in Australia uh, to control uh, insects in the cane fields. And this uh, cane toad, it turns out, is poisonous to people and has uh, the populations of the cane toad have exploded to the point where it's a worse pest than the um, uh, organisms it was brought in to um, control. So those are a couple of examples, and there's many other examples of uh, biocontrol. So uh, it, it, these can be both um, positive and they can also be uh, uh, potentially very destructive. So uh, proceed with care in using uh, these biocontrols.
Uh, one of the uh, ideas that I um, brought up earlier was the use of legislative controls and uh, at the federal government level uh, various uh, laws have been enacted including the federal insecticide fungicide and rosenicide act FRA, uh, which uh, legislates the use of um, chemicals for uh, control of these pests and also puts uh, management under the control of the Environmental Protection Agency. So the EPA is the umbrella organization that uh, regulates the use of these uh, chemicals that are widely used uh, but can potentially be harmful. And then there's some other uh, federal uh, laws that are listed under here. Illinois has uh, the Illinois Department of Trans uh, excuse me, the Illinois Department of Agriculture has a variety of uh, laws that they operate under and some of the uh, a couple of examples are the Illinois Exotic Weed Act and the uh, noxious weed law um, that uh, try to manage a few of the invasive plants that have um, moved into the state. And the city of Chicago on the local level has also passed an ordinance that restricts sale and distribution of many exotic plants. Um, so this I think is a pretty uh, proactive uh, bit of uh, uh, legislation at the local level and I include a link uh, to a free brochure that you can um, access in order to learn more about the invasive plants um, that the city of Chicago attempts to regulate. Um, I don't have a lot of material on this topic but something we'll be talking about uh, in the greenhouse uh, as uh, we uh, uh, grow plants and prepare them for sale at the CLC plant sale will be this topic of hardening off. And hardening off is basically just taking plants and transitioning them or acclimatizing them to the from the very protected conditions in the greenhouse to prepare them for planting out in uh, more natural conditions uh, in the field or in their uh, garden where they're going to end up. So. Um, there's a number of issues uh, in transition. So all of the, let me start that again, all of the uh, factors that we try to control for in the greenhouse, light, temperature, moisture, um, um, lack of wind, uh, lack of predators, are things that these plants will encounter once they're planted out. And so the idea is to try to anticipate and prepare them uh, for the conditions that they'll receive and, and this idea of hardening off uh, is to gradually expose tender plants to these conditions uh, to toughen them up to thicken the leaf cuticle and the other organs uh, so that they are adapted and prepared uh, uh, to be planted and to prevent transplant shock. Uh, the amount of time for hardening off the type of plants and the uh, uh, conditions that need to be um, that these plants need to be exposed to depends on a lot of factors and and also um, as they're uh, transitioned outdoors uh, a lot of the uh, um, consideration involves being prepared to move them back indoors if there's a late freeze or a snow that could kill these plants so uh, the topic of hardening off is uh, fairly uh, complex uh, and it's very important, uh, especially if you're uh, propagating plants for uh, sale or for uh, planting outdoors. So this is the wrap-up on accelerated growth techniques. Uh, it's a fairly complete set of practices designed to optimize, optimize plant performance and to get the desired plants with consistent quality uh, minimal disease and damage from uh, disease and, and harmful organisms uh, ready for sale or planting and to do so at minimal cost and uh, at the minimum amount of time uh, spent tying up a greenhouse or a propagation bed. Um, however, um, you know it's nice to be able to uh, generalize uh, about these um, ideas but uh, these practices can vary widely between species, climatic zones, uh, transition, traditional versus organic cultural practices and economics. So 
uh, one way of helping you to um, uh, get an, a little bit better idea of some of the um, complexity uh, below the surface here is to send you out and to visit a greenhouse and uh, in your visits um, maybe you can use what you've learned in this lecture to ask some of the good questions and begin to um, understand the complexities of this topic of accelerated growth techniques. So here's your uh, discussion question for the week. It's about chemical pesticides. Uh, and I'm asking you to describe an interesting example of an IPM technique other than chemical pesticides. What are the pros and cons of that technique? And unfortunately, as I hope was clear from the lecture, there are cons to almost all of these things. And your assignment of greenhouse visit is due at the end of uh, uh, of this assignment. And I'm giving you um, um, some suggested um, uh, issues on which to comment in your report. So your report um, can be a page or two um, double spaced, uh, but I'd like you to uh, to think about and review uh, some of these business and production issues um, um, that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks of this of this uh, course. And finally, um, I'd like your now that we're into the uh, course, uh, we're in the third lesson. I'd like your comments about the textbook. Uh, it, at, in some points it's pretty technical and um, has a wealth of relevant information. Um, it gets into depth that I cannot get into in these uh, brief lectures. I do not want to spend hours lecturing at you and uh, a text is in, in the videos and the uh, other readings are important ways to get um, more information out of this class than I can give you in you know 30 or 40 minutes worth of lectures. So, um, but the survey, uh, if you'd please give me your input on these uh, on these questions, the amount of time that you took, and your assessment of the value of the information it would be very helpful to me in uh, designing my materials and in uh, offering future versions of this class going forward. Uh, so that is it for uh, Unit 3. Uh, for Unit 4, we'll have another lab and we'll get into uh, seed uh, germination, uh, seed viability testing, and we will produce hardwood cuttings in the lab at CLC. So looking forward to that. And in the meantime, let me know if you have any questions um, uh, or other things I can help you with.